children. We ask human children to think about adult humans. What we really want to do in these kinds of experiments, I think, is to cr uh, create a situation where the communicator and the hider were other chimpanzees. Okay, want to train them to perform these kinds of tests so we can actually see whether chimpanzees can read the minds uh, the, the, re read the mind of another chimpanzee. One thing we know for sure from um, from uh, uh, the, the work of Franz de Waal and others is that there is plenty of evidence of social learning in chimpanzees uh, and, uh, and, uh, and other great apes. Uh, so that they do learn from each other. Uh, they, they do get the idea that if I do what this chimpanzee does, I'll get what this chimpanzee gets uh, and, uh, and, and all of that. So it's possible that apes have a theory of the ape mind even if they don't have a theory of the human mind. Um, as, uh, as we expect them to in these, kinds of, uh, in these kinds of experiments. Okay, so on the basis of, re of, of, uh, of uh, studies like this, there are now a bunch of them, um, uh, Mike Tomasello and his, uh, and his colleagues have suggested that uh, whatever theory of mind a chimpanzee has, it's extremely, uh, it's extremely limited. What chimpanzees seem to be able to do is to, is to connect percepts, that is, their mental representations of environmental stimuli with various kinds of goals. Uh, they, may kind of, they may be able to learn where food is hidden uh, or, uh, or whatever. They may be able to understand other chimpanzees and other humans' goals and, uh, and, uh, and intentions. But what they don't seem to have is what all normal humans have, which is what's known as a belief-desire psychology. My Belief is that it's going to rain, um, so I desire not to get wet, so I carry an umbrella. To be able to, con to connect those things up and explain people's behavior in terms of their beliefs and desires, that's something that, as far as we can tell, chimpanzees uh, just, uh, just don't uh, have. Or put another way, chimpanzees seem not to have the capacity to explain another creature's beliefs, uh, the, the, to explain another creature's actions in terms of his uh, or, uh, or her beliefs. Okay, so let's review the, the, the bidding for a second. If consciousness, if your behavioral index of consciousness is something like the false belief test for the theory of mind, then we know that adult humans have consciousness, which is something I think we knew right at the beginning of the course. We also know that young children have consciousness because they'll pass uh, nonverbal versions of the false belief test, even infants will have uh, at least the rudiments of, uh, of consciousness. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but autistic children tend not to pass the false belief test, which raises the question of how much consciousness uh, autistic children uh, might have. And chimpanzees and other uh, great apes uh, don't seem to have it uh, either. So that's kind of a quick and dirty summary of, of, of this literature. Which, raises to, which, which goes back and raises one last question about human consciousness, which is, have we always had it? We tend to think about consciousness as a human cognitive characteristic, something that comes to us by virtue of having human brains uh, that evolved over the, uh, over the course of evolutionary time. But there are some reasons for thinking that maybe even humans didn't always have consciousness as we recognize it in, um, uh, in uh, behaviors like performance on the, on the false belief test, okay? This brings us not the, the, to not the ontogenetic view of development, not the phylogenetic view of development, but to the cultural view of, uh, of development. We know that humans, 21st century humans at least, have a theory of the mind. We're, we recognize um, mental states in ourselves. We impute mental states to other people. We explain people's behaviors in terms of their beliefs and other, uh, and other mental states. As I said before, we like to think of human consciousness as part of our phylogenetic heritage, something we got when we uh, kind of came down from the trees, if that's, uh, if that's exactly what happened. But it's entirely possible that human consciousness developed in something like historical time. That is, that consciousness, uh, as we understand it today, developed over the history of, uh, of our species. 
The guy who's made this argument most forcefully and uh, most provocatively uh, is now deceased, a, a psychologist at Princeton University named Julian Jaynes, who wrote a very provocative book about uh, 35 years ago now um, uh, called The Origins of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And the, uh, the origins of Jaynes's idea actually came to him when he was reading uh, Homer's Iliad, which some of you may have read at least, uh, at least parts of, and he realized that the characters in the Iliad don't really seem human. Okay? Uh, in, in particular, there's little or no evidence of consciousness in, the, in, uh, in, uh, in Homer's Iliad. Uh, nobody makes any decisions, there's one exception. Nobody makes any decisions in Homer's Iliad. Uh, nobody thinks, nobody introspects, nobody sits down and says, oh, I wonder what I should do now, um, or, or what's going to happen next. And uh, you know, nobody really reminisces, nobody thinks about the past. Uh, they seem to be operating more or less on, uh, on automatic pilot. And in particular, in the Iliad, what happens mostly is a product of the gods telling men what to do. Okay? Uh, it's not a product of gods deciding, of, of, of men deciding for themselves. What happens is men receive messages from the gods and then they go out and carry out uh, their, uh, their orders. In the study of ancient literature, this is often thought of as a poetic device. But Jane said, maybe it's not a poetic device. Maybe this is just the way things were roughly at the time that the Iliad is supposed to have occurred, um, you know, a, a, couple of thousand, uh, a couple of thousand years uh, uh, B, uh, BC. Uh, let's just take, uh, as, as an example, uh, the very first lines of Homer's Iliad. Um, uh, okay, rage goddess, sing the rage of Peleus' son Achilles, murderous, doomed, that cost the Achaeans countless losses, blah, 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 with the will of Zeus moving toward its end, okay? Uh, and then the poet asks uh, the, the, the muse to spin, out, uh, to spin out this tale. And as you follow the events in the Iliad, it turns out that what all the major events in the Iliad, with one exception really, uh, uh, are, are things that are instigated by the gods, not instigated uh, by the men. So, for example, how did the Trojan War start? Well, the Trojan War started because Paris kidnapped Helen and took her on, 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 off to Troy. Uh, Helen was Agamemnon's uh, uh, wife. And um, uh, it's, how did that happen? Well, it wasn't that Paris wanted Helen. It wasn't that Paris and Helen fell in love and they decided to elope or anything like that. No, what happens is three goddesses come to Paris, who's a, actually a prince disguised as a shepherd boy, uh, and ask him to judge um, uh, which one of them is the most beautiful. And one of the goddesses simply bribes uh, Paris by saying, if you choose me, I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you have Helen. Okay, and Paris, and Paris says, oh, okay, you know, that's fine. Uh, so, I, so, so I choose you. Um, later on in the Iliad, there's a duel between Menelaus and, uh, and, and Paris, and uh, just at the point where one of them is about to kill the other one, uh, then the gods intervene, right? And it just, and, 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 and it just doesn't happen. Uh, at, at another point uh, in, in, in the Iliad, uh, Helen is uh, standing on the walls of Troy, looking at the Greek armies, and she's completely impassive. She, uh, she names the ships, uh, wh where they came from, she names the generals and all of that, but she doesn't ha seem to have any idea that she's the cause of all of this. There's just a little teeny tiny tinge of, uh, of regret uh, in, the, uh, in the text. And then later on, when Achilles uh, kills his great uh, Trojan rival Hector, uh, he uh, uh, ties his, uh, Achilles is one mad hombre during the entire uh, the Iliad. He uh, drags Hector's uh, body around the walls of Troy, and he refuses to give, um, to, to give Hector's body back to uh, uh, his father uh, for burial until a god comes along and says, oh, go do it. Okay, and then Achilles says, oh, okay, I'll do it. Really, the only decision that gets made in the whole of the Iliad is once when Achilles decides 
he's not going to fight anymore, and then later on when he changes his mind. Everything else is basically done by, uh, at the instigation of the, uh, of the god. Okay? Now, this is completely different from the picture that you get in the Odyssey, uh, which is ostensibly by Homer, but is actually a much more recent uh, poem. Think, think about how the Odyssey begins. Sing to, me, sing to me of the man, muse, the man of twists and turns. Uh, Odysseus is a great um, uh, uh, the, the trickster. Many cities of men he saw and learned their minds. Uh, many pains he suffered and so on. Uh, uh, so what, what goes on in the Odyssey is that Ulysses is always thinking. He's always trying to figure out what somebody else is going to think. He's always playing tricks uh, on, uh, on, on people in a, in a way that's completely absent uh, in, the, uh, in the Iliad. So, for example, Odysseus hooks up with Calypso uh, at one point, and she says, why don't you stay with me? You know, she's a beautiful woman, and it's really nice on, uh, on, 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 on the island. He says, no, I really want to go home. I want to see my wife Penelope. I want to go back to, uh, to Ithaca. Uh, when Odysseus and his men are trapped by the Cyclops, uh, uh, the Polyphemus, uh, for the first thing they do is they blind Polyphemus because they know that once he's blinded, he can't see, and then they engage in some trickery uh, to, get, uh, uh, to, to get out of uh, Polyphemus's cave. When uh, Polyphemus asks um, uh, the, the Odysseus uh, uh, who it is who's tormenting him, uh, Odysseus says, my name is nobody. And then later on, when, uh, when, when uh, the, uh, Odysseus's men escape and uh, uh, the Polyphemus cries for help from his, uh, from his fellow Cyclopses, they, they, they respond by saying, who's bothering you? And Polyphemus says, nobody's bothering me. And then they just go about their business, right? Because nobody's bothering him. This is a trick that, you, that, that, that Odysseus uh, pulls. Uh, later on, um, Odysseus and his men pass, sail past the sirens, and he has himself tied to the mast so that he can't heed the call of the sirens, the seductive call of the sirens, but he puts wax in his, uh, in his uh, men's ears so that they can't hear them at all. He's thinking about what other people think. The Odyssey is full of this, uh, of, of this kind of language. Um, here's something else. Here's a, 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 a later uh, myth from the, the third century uh, uh, the BC, where Jason, this is Jason of the Argonauts, uh, okay, um, look at it. He, he didn't know what to say. Uh, he, was at a, he was at a loss as to how to deal with this situation. He turned over and over what he should do, okay. None of this language appears uh, in, the, uh, in the Iliad, okay. Here's another example uh, from, the, uh, from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, many of the Old Testament uh, the prophets start their prophecies by saying, thus saith the Lord, as if the prophet is repeating something that the Lord has said, uh, uh, said to him. Uh, whereas, if you look at a more recent uh, book in the Hebrew Bible, uh, like Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes is thinking for himself. He's got his own ideas. He's not just repeating uh, what the Lord uh, has, uh, has said to him. James's idea was that, um, and was kind of influenced by uh, the, early, uh, the uh, early 1970s uh, the neuropsychology that made this distinction between the right and left hemispheres uh, more severe uh, than, than it should be, was that we have bicameral minds. Uh, there's a decision-making part, 